Uh, good afternoon. My name is Yavana Knezhevich, and I am the Associate Director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies here at Stanford. And it is our great pleasure today uh, to welcome writer Andrei Kurkov. Um, I am here only to welcome you to the session as you all filter in uh, and uh, give a few procedural notes. Um, so after uh, the presentation, which will last about 45 minutes, there will be time for Q&A and discussion. Uh, so please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to uh, submit questions um, during the talk and afterwards. Uh, and with that, I would like to pass it over to my colleague, um, Yulia Ilchuk, um, professor in the Slavic department here at Stanford, who will introduce to you our speaker. Thank you, Johanna, for introducing uh, uh... Andrei's talk and also Michael for organizing this event. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us in the afternoon. Uh, I will tell a bit uh, about uh, Andrei's uh, background. Uh, many of you have read his uh, novels. Uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, Ukrainian audience uh, uh, today at the talk. Uh, so Andrei is uh, the one of the most prominent uh, Russian language Ukrainian writer who wrote uh, about 20 novels, mostly in Ukrainian, and 10 children's books that were translated in 37 different languages. Uh, recently, his book, uh, recent novel, The Great Beast, was translated by, by, by Boris Dreluk and published uh, in the uh, British uh, uh, press. Uh, and it, it will appear in the American press uh, next year. Uh, during this year, Andrea is a Fulbright Fellow in the University of California, San Diego, doing research about Americans' uh, perception of uh, Ukraine uh, throughout its 20th century history. Uh, so without uh, uh, any other remarks, uh, I will now uh, let uh, Andrei talk and I will start sharing his slides. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody, especially those who are in Ukraine, if you are not asleep. And uh, uh, I'd like to correct a bit what Yulia said. I write mostly in Russian, although some books I have written in Ukrainian. And I'm probably quite a typical example of a Ukrainian citizen of non-Ukrainian origin. I'm ethnic Russian. But Ukraine is a multicultural and multilingual country with one state language, Ukrainian, as with dozens of different minorities living on the outskirts or even in the middle of Ukraine. Uh, you see the, the map of, the, uh, of Ukraine. I was choosing actually between three or four uh, dozens of different maps of Ukraine. And uh, this is Ukraine today, but even this map doesn't reflect the political reality of today's Ukraine because part of the uh, territory of Ukraine is annexed or occupied by separatists and uh, pro-Russian and Russian volunteers, and uh, which shows that Ukrainian history was very dynamic and dramatic and remains very dynamic and dramatic. And the word violence, unfortunately, also belongs to Ukrainian history, but uh, historically, uh, violence belongs to the Middle Ages and to 16th, 17th centuries everywhere in Europe, in Russia, in uh, Poland, in America. And uh, I want uh, now to go probably back a bit for some short period of time of my talk uh, to the Ukrainian past for us to better understand uh, where Ukraine comes from, because I hope that not all the listeners of my talk today are Ukrainians or are well aware of Ukrainian history. And please, uh, Yulia, show the next uh, uh, slide. This is the most famous image of Ukrainians, uh, probably uh, universally. This is a picture of Ilya Repin, uh, famous uh, Russian uh, artist with Ukrainian roots. Uh, and the title of this painting is uh, Zaporizhia Cossacks are writing a letter to Turkish Sultan. You can see that actually they are enjoying writing this letter in which they are actually abusing him and uh, sending him very nasty remarks, etc. So, I mean, in order to talk uh, about Ukrainian mentality, Ukrainian history, we should know where does it come from and uh, uh, first, I wanted actually to give you some internationally 
information on the Cossacks of Ukraine. And I will ask you to show next slide with short information about the beginning of this new martial society on Ukrainian territory. And the word Kazakh comes from Turkic and means adventurer or free man. Free man is very important actually uh, for my talk. And, and now please uh, let's go to the next page. And we'll come to 16th century uh, when uh, the first military organization of a very peculiarly democratic order uh, with a general assembly with some kind of pro-parliament and uh, elections uh, were, were organized in Ukrainian territory. Now we can stop here. You can see that actually Ukraine at that time uh, was, was not really a state, independent state. It was self-governed territory of a sort uh, run by Cossacks who were defending the borders. And at the same time, they were electing their leaders. Leaders were called hetmans. And these were actually hetmans were not Tsars or kings. They were uh, the leaders of the army of Cossacks. There was a system of courts, civil courts and military courts. There was no currency uh, in Ukraine, its own. I mean, they were paying each other with Polish, Polish silver, Russian gold, etc. And the territory was changing because the, uh, the borders were front lines, actually. And from time to time, Cossacks were siding with Poles against Russians and the Turks, sometimes with Crimean Tatars against Poles, sometimes with Russians against Poles. There were a lot of issues where, which were common and not common between different uh, neighbors of uh, Ukraine. I mean, like uh, Russians and Ukrainians were mostly Orthodox. Poles were Catholics. This was one of the divisions. But at the same time, uh, Poles were controlling sometimes the, the, uh, the border, the territory much better and in a more organized way than uh, Russians on the East. And so if you find the list of uh, hetmans, uh, you will uh, see some uh, on this list uh, uh, a short description of uh, each hetman, whether the, he, he was pro-Polish or pro-Russian or appointed, because some of the hetmans were appointed, so they were not elected. And the, the, this Cossack's social structure and life created the Ukrainian mentality or matrix of Ukrainian mentality, which is based, if to say in one word, on anarchy, in the, another word on individualism, because uh, every time one hetman was elected by uh, olders, by Starshini, uh, there would be already almost ready coup d'etat to remove him and to try to uh, elect another hetman. And we uh, can see this actually situation repeating itself in post-Soviet Ukraine, but I will talk about this later. Elections of hetmans existed on Ukrainian territory for almost two centuries. And then after 1654, after agreement between hetman Bogdan Khmelnytsky and Russian Tsar, uh, the independence of Ukrainian territory was over. So, I mean, uh, Ukrainian hetman asked Russian Tsar to help uh, to fight against Poles and uh, as the result, actually, uh, Ukraine became a uh, territory under Russian control and, and later part of Russian empire. Although, I mean, not many people uh, know, if they are not historians, that most of the Ukrainian territory uh, at some point were also under Poland, including the capital of uh, Ukraine, Kyiv. Uh, let's go now to the next slide. And here uh, we can see typical paintings of Ukrainian hetmans. Uh, Ukrainians didn't want and never wanted to have a Tsar. Uh, they lived between two monarchies. Poland at that time had system where the Tsars or kings were elected. In Russia, there were royal dynasties. And Ukraine uh, never dreamt of having it's a monarchy. The monarchy is very unnatural thing for Ukrainian mentality because it clashes with the 
with, with, with the meaning of the freedom. Freedom and will is the most important thing. That's why actually, if you compare Russian mentality and Ukrainian mentality for Ukrainians, actually uh, freedom is more is important than security. In Russia, you can see that the security is more important than freedom. That's why actually Ukrainians always wanted to have more rights. And the Russian empire realized it and they were trying to control Ukraine as much as possible. And later, Soviet Union was fighting against Ukrainian individualism in many different ways, in many ways collect, connected with violence. I mean, for example, deportations of Ukrainian independent farmers in 1932-33 and before. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of uh, farmers and their families sent to Siberia and many of them perished on the way or there. And later they were assimilated practically by force by the Soviet system. The artificial famines of 1932-33 and 47-48 they, they were also uh, attempts to quash, to destroy this individualistic mentality, to turn Ukrainian people into the Soviet people. What is the difference between Soviets and Ukrainians or Russians and Ukrainians? And I'm talking myself as an ethnic Russian, so I think I have a right to compare these two mentalities. The mentality uh, which has a, a historical matrix of monarchy is based on collectiveness on collective obedience or collective disobedience. They want these people one power, uh, one guarantee of security, one God. And actually this is why uh, Russia was a monarchy where everybody was adoring the Tsar, but if they were fed up with the Tsar, they would kill him or overthrow and adore the next one. In Ukraine, it was always a huge problem to elect hetman. And actually uh, everyone has its own and had its own idea how Ukraine should function, what kind of state it should be, etc. And the same when you have people with so many different and opposite views, you understand that actually you have to learn how to negotiate and how to respect your op opponents. It doesn't work always, but uh, it's interesting that uh, if we mention now the today's main political party of Ukraine, which holds the majority in Ukrainian parliament, the servant of the people, the party which was created online by uh, president, today's president Zelensky, uh, th this is actually a structure of Ukrainian society in miniature. You have no ideology, you have actually uh, people with opposite views sometimes who are kept together, kept together by different means, including actually by probably by some kind of uh, uh, enforcement or negotiations or maybe threats. We, we don't know. We will know it maybe in 20 years time. But uh, now uh, let's go to the next slide and we will see the last hetman of Ukraine, Pavlos Skoropatsky. Uh, so Ukrainians, after the so-called Great October Revolution of 1917, when Bolsheviks uh, took power uh, and the civil war started, which lasted until to, uh, 1921, in Ukraine there were several different warring sides fighting for the territories, fighting to control Ukraine. And uh, one of them was uh, actually Skoropatsky's force that uh, the Ukrainians who wanted to have a separate state. And again, they didn't want to create their president or to create uh, the, the Tsar. They wanted to reinstate the position of Hetman. So the, the head of the state who is first of all head of the army and who is guarant, guarant of uh, uh, independence of the country. Unfortunately, uh, the time uh, when Hetman of Ukraine, Pavlo Skoropatsky, was in power, uh, was very short from uh, 29th of April until uh, 14th of December 1918. And he lost because of the individualistic mentality of Ukrainians against collective mentality of Bolsheviks. Because still, 
the Bolsheviks actually were using the instruments to unite people against either against rich bourgeois or against the Western countries, Antanta, or against nationalists or patriots or people who wanted to create their own state, whether small or big, large on the territory of Russian empire. Uh, we can now uh, go to the next slide. And uh, I'm not, I sort of, I'm jumping 70 years uh, from 18 to 91. But uh, what I want to say that actually collective mentality of Russian empire uh, very easily traveled and transformed itself into collective mentality of Soviet empire. The monarchy changed the face. Now we had elected monarchy, uh, which means that six uh, general secretaries of the Soviet Union, among them only one actually uh, was dismissed and everybody else was re-elected until the moment of death of this or that leader. Uh, interesting is that actually out of these six uh, leaders of the Soviet Union, three were from Ukraine. Three were representatives of Soviet Ukrainian people. So people who were trying actually to adapt to new role and to new society and to new Soviet mentality and who succeeded. Although, I mean, I should mention that the only person who was thrown out from Kremlin before his death, Nikita Khrushchev, he was the representative of double mentality. I mean, he had obviously a conflict in himself, a conflict of collective mentality from Soviet and Russian, origin and Ukrainian mentality, individualistic. That's why he didn't fit very much in the structure of the Soviet uh, system. And he was thrown out. Uh, other two Ukrainians, Chernyanka and Brezhnev, I mean, they were more, first of all, Soviet people. They were not really Ukrainians. And uh, uh, well, uh, inertion of Soviet life continued for many countries in the same way uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, with the exception of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Ukraine was following in social sense uh, all the steps which were uh, done by the societies uh, in uh, Russia or Moldova or Belarus. And that meant actually that the still Soviet mentality was ruling on the ruins of the Soviet Union, where some new forms of economical, political, and social life were starting. And in the end, uh, it was obvious that actually when Russia became uh, more ambitious again, when the economical crisis was over, Russia decided to uh, collect the lands again, to expand, to, to restore what could be restored from the ruins of the Soviet Union. And, what are the instruments of this kind of restoration? Of course, first of all, Russian language, which didn't disappear from uh, most of the countries at that time, and uh, collective mentality. Uh, collective mentality also means that to explain to others that they are like us, that we are one people. And the, the idea that Ukrainians, Belarusians, and uh, Russians are one people is still very popular in uh, in the Kremlin, and uh, we can hear it on Russian TV every day. But at the same time, the new generation, which uh, was born before the collapse of the Soviet Union, was growing and was trying to build completely new life. And the clash, the biggest conflict between the new life and an attempt to lead old life in new circumstances, uh, the, the, this happened in 2004, and we know these events as Orange Revolution. Uh, please, Yulia, uh, show us the next slide. Uh, well, uh, here we can say that uh, this was really not only revolution, but as any revolution actually usually happens together with counter-revolution, which means that actually there are two groups in the society which want the opposite things. This was the clash of two mentalities. And here I should explain that uh, Ukraine, 
uh, with its 40 million population, with huge territory, with very different landscapes and different languages spoken from Hungarian on the West uh, to Greek in the South. Uh, it was divided after the collapse of the Soviet Union into two parts, uh, if we can say mentally. So the uh, large part of Ukraine uh, were the carriers, people were carriers of Soviet collective mentality. And uh, only three regions with plus small districts in the West were the holders and uh, the representative of Ukrainian individualistic mentality, which uh, is taking roots in Cossack's times. So we, we had actually, uh, one can say, the representatives of collective monarchic mentality uh, in the East mostly and partially in the center and uh, representatives of individualistic, partially anarchic mentality in the West. But for Ukrainians, for many Ukrainians, for young Ukrainians, actually the image of free Ukrainian from the West was an example to follow. And also it coincided with the idea that if you are free, then you can become a small entrepreneur, you can become a businessman, you can do what you want, you take care of yourself. And so the West of Ukraine, the Western Ukraine and Central Ukraine were the main territories where young people started small businesses. And the East of Ukraine remained for many times and actually some territories until today, the regions where collective Soviet mentality prevailed and people were leading the same way in industrial uh, uh, cities, uh, the same way of life as before the Soviet, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, if you have uh, collective mentality and people lead in this old way of life, you have more control over these people. And that's why actually you can check that uh, the percentage of small businesses opened and started in the east of the country was much, much smaller than in the west and in the center. Another specialty was that uh, very often small businesses in uh, Donbass were run by relatives of uh, chinovniki, of clerks, of, of, of the people who actually work in administrations or the, the administrators themselves. So the practically, uh, one uh, people, one party uh, uh, system, uh, which is very Russian thing uh, happened uh, in Donbass. I mean, the party of region, which was the party uh, created by Yanukovych was a copycat uh, party of Yedina Russia, United Russia. And actually, if you compare the uh, ways these parties uh, expanded and uh, worked, you will find a lot of similarities. So the, the Orange Revolution was actually a clash between individualistic mentality and the desire to be free and independent. It was a clash uh, of European Ukraine with Soviet Ukraine, or Soviet and post-Soviet Ukraine, where people wanted to have more security than freedom, where people wanted to have, have a strong leader, less freedom of speech, less, less freedom of expression, but well-organized and well-structured system where everyone knows his or her place. And uh, uh, if uh, this would have been the only Ukrainian revolution, I think it would be very interesting to follow how the events would take place later because we know that Orange Revolution has won individualism uh, had more power, at least more public display of power. And as the result, Viktor Yushchenko was elected as president. But in this situation, actually, he looks like uh, he became hetman. Uh, it's true that actually uh, we, we still have uh, Cossacks in Ukraine, which is more like a theatrical game where people are more Kazakophiles them, Cossacks themselves, and they were promoting the historical images and historical uh, armor of Cossacks. In every country you have this 
reconstructors of uh, ancient battles of ancient armies, etc. So the image of Cossack was always popular and positive in Ukraine, especially in Central and Western Ukraine. And I will ask now uh, Yulia to, to move on. And uh, this is a poster of Viktor Yushchenko uh, with very interesting uh, uh, inscription, the wording, which says, Viktor Yushchenko is the only one uncontrolled by Kremlin. Well, this uh, slogan was probably the most clever one to get support from Ukrainians, because Ukrainians or Ukrainian territory were all centuries under controls of different countries. There was also time when a large part of Ukraine was under control of Lithuania, but Lithuanians were nominally uh, owners of Ukrainian territory, but they were quite apparently nice and never interfered with Uk Ukrainian way of life, never interfered with Ukrainian language which was banned 40 times by different Russian Tsars. So there is a very positive memory about Lithuania. And as the result, Lithuania remains for already more than 10 years, the main advocate of uh, Ukraine in uh, Europe. And uh, of course, uh, Poland is our second main advocate, but uh, with Poland, we have much more difficult relationship because they did impose uh, Polish language, they did impose their way of, of life, and they controlled also Ukraine during Cossacks' year and Hetman's year in a more rough way. Well, as you know, uh, Yushinka won over a representative of collective mentality, Viktor Yanukovych, who was the governor before of Donbass and uh, who was formerly pro-Russian, but at the same time, actually, he had some features also very Ukrainian. Uh, and uh, the result of uh, this was that he didn't allow Russian oligarchs to come on Donbass territory. Donbass had to belong to Ukrainian to Donbass oligarchs. And that was also an interesting point in uh, this situation. But uh, when Yanukovych First, uh, I mean, Yushchenko uh, did allow Yanukovych to become prime minister because, of course, large part of population still had uh, support for Yanukovych, which means had support for collective mentality and for the way Yanukovych was thinking. Uh, please, uh, let's go to next slide. And here we have uh, uh, pictures of uh, practically anti-Maidan people in Odessa and in Kharkiv. And in Kharkiv on the left, on the uh, poster, we can see the inscription, Russia save us, SOS. On the right in Odessa with the Russian banner, uh, somebody is holding a, a slogan, Odessa is a Russian city. So for Ukraine, uh, the regional differences and mental differences are very, uh, important and very dangerous. And uh, if there was no war in Donbass now, if there were no annexation of Crimea, we would have the process of mentality border, which divides individualistic mentality from collective mentality, moving slowly to the East, and maybe in 20 or 30 years, reaching the uh, geographical border between Russia and Ukraine. But of course, people with individualist mentality don't have much patience. And people with, with collective mentality, and especially in Russia, I mean, they were understanding the dangers of Ukraine again going out of control. So they wanted at least to control part of Ukraine. And therefore, we have now uh, separatists in the East and uh, annexed Crimea which uh, I think deserves a separate talk, but I, I will not expand uh, into these uh, questions of annexation of Crimea, because the topic is more connected with uh, today's political situation. And uh, I will ask now, uh, Yulia, to move on. 
Next slide, please. Well, uh, this is already Euromaidan 2013, and my memories uh, are uh, very vivid until today. Actually, I was uh, uh, on Maidan uh, all autumn, winter, and spring 2013, 2014. And my first experience was quite interesting because uh, I came uh, first time when the protests began and I was talking to people who came and who stay and who settled there. And I wanted to find out actually what they want. Do they have common demands? Do they have common leaders? And they didn't have leaders and they have very different demands. And uh, some people actually came because they wanted to stay there until Russian language disappears from the streets of Ukraine, which is very radical idea. The others came to fight against corruption on the state level. The others came to against corruption in their village because they were upset and they couldn't find justice and they were mistreated by local authorities. And some of them actually were dressed in Vishivanki in the embroidered short like um, a man uh, in the middle. Some of them were wearing Cossacks uniforms and these were sometimes actually the uniforms taken from theaters, local theaters, or purposely uh, created by people who were uh, fans of Cossacks movement. And, uh, and this actually, the historical matrix came back, I mean, when the country is in turmoil, uh, and Ukraine was in turmoil after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and then during Orange Revolution, and then during Euromaidan, the historical matrix is something people are trying to refer to and thinking that that will help. The past will help to stabilize the country and to achieve what the country needs to become stable and prosperous. And uh, with every day, actually, we had more and more people like this uh, on Maidan. And uh, of course, uh, I mean, Cossacks is ethnic thing. Ukrainian Cossacks, although I mean, uh, there should have been different nationalities, but I mean, generally it associates with Ukrainian language and Ukrainian culture. And a couple of days ago, we had the National Identity Day, which is the day of Vishivanka, day of the embroidered short, uh, the one which is when worn on the photo. And on this day, actually, uh, people are wearing embroidered shorts, uh, and not only ethnic Ukrainians, but I mean, you can uh, wear it as sign of identity or sign of solidarity with Ukraine. And many Crimean Tatars were wearing uh, uh, embroidered Ukrainian shorts and other nationalities and other minorities. I mean, it's a question of loyalty. It's not a uh, issue of only ethnic roots. And this matrix for Ukraine mentality remains very important uh, even today. And let's go now to the next slide. And uh, uh, here, actually, I took this photo uh, in 2014. And uh, this is probably one of the last photos of Sergei Nigayan, Armenian from Dnipropetrovsk region, who was uh, first victim of uh, Euromaidan, who was killed on one day together with Belarusian participant of Maidan, Evgeny Zhiznevsky. Let's uh, go further, please. And uh, this is already from Euromaidan times uh, to make uh, historical metrics more popular among young people. Uh, young designers, web designers created wallpapers and pictures for internet, for smartphones, etc. And here we see that actually the promotion of this historical matrix is uh, becoming more active, more dynamic, and uh, spreads among the youth, among Ukrainian young people. Let's uh, move on. And uh, uh, Euromaidan in the beginning didn't have leaders. Uh, I mean, one can say that Orange Revolution also first was protest, and then the leaders joined the protests and became the leaders. The same situation was. Uh, in Euromaidan. 
And these are only four of people who actually became faces of the Euromaidan. But there was also famous uh, boxer Vitaly Klitschko, who is today the mayor of Kyiv. There was Yulia Timoshenko, Ukrainian politician, who was released from uh, prison where she spent the, in the prison hospital two years during Yanukovych rule, etc. And uh, uh, the, I mean, th these are people of different nationalities, but I mean, they they were they became leaders of Maidan, and they actually they became leaders of post-Maidan Ukraine. And uh, the first one is uh, Pyotr Poroshenko, uh, the sugar producer, chocolate producer, bus producer oligarch, one can say, who has a small TV channel, information TV channel number five, with not so many uh, viewers and one more, even smaller TV channel. The second personality is very interesting, Alexander Turchinov, politician from Dnipropetrovsk region and Baptist priest. And I think because of his activity, he was one of the most active leaders of Maidan, and later he became the head of the Secret Service of Ukraine and a member of the Security Council. Uh, I think his activities uh, probably uh, forced or provoked uh, President Putin to ban Baptist Church and all other non-Orthodox churches uh, on Russian territory. Uh, I would say not non-traditional non-Orthodox churches. I don't think Catholic Church is banned, but Evangelists, Baptists and uh, other churches are banned and they uh, are called extremists. Yuri Lutsenko, who used to be a uh, uh, minister of uh, interior, is the third, and Yaroslav uh, Yatsenyuk, uh, he was the prime minister of Ukraine after, and actually I think he was uh, prime minister before uh, Maidan at some point. Uh, well, when Euromaidan started, we had, of course, all TV channels showing their regular programs. And uh, as always, the most popular TV channels, they are airing usually comedy shows and political talk shows. And comedy shows are always much more popular. And uh, in 2014, 2015, uh, probably the most popular comedy show, which is called Quartal 95 or Block 95, uh, was showing um, parodies on Maidan and on the events in Ukraine, on Ukrainian politicians altogether. And we can go now to the uh, next slide, which shows actually a photo from one of the parodies uh, where, with the, on the left, today's president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, who is the head of this uh, production company who uh, produces uh, the comedy show. And uh, on the second from the right, uh, uh, Oleg Koshovoy, comedian who refused to become a member of parliament, thanks uh, to him. Uh, he is showing a parody on Vitaly Klitschko, a boxer, a champion boxer. Uh, well, uh, now we will talk about Ukrainian television and finally we are coming to the main point of my talk and we are moving to the next slide, please. Well, TV culture in Ukraine is a powerful instrument. And all TV channels belong to different oligarchs. And the biggest TV channel uh, and the most popular one plus one belongs to the probably main uh, oligarch of Ukraine, Igor Kolomoisky. And uh, this TV channel has 61% uh, of audience in Ukraine altogether. People are generally getting information from TV in Ukraine. Uh, the percentage of people who get the information from internet or from newspapers is not really significant. And here we can see three main TV channels belonging to three different oligarchs. But uh, the TV channel One Plus One of Igor Kolomoisky at some point bought out a comedy show Block 95 from, uh, I think, from the TV channel Inter. And uh, and it was and it is, remains a very popular show. And uh, this show was always very political, this comedy show. So uh, practically starting from uh, 2015, 14, the leaders of uh, Euromaidan, the politicians, 
uh, also actually uh, from before Maidan times, uh, they became the main characters in uh, comedy sketches uh, uh, by, by this comedy group. And, uh, and this show was practically aired almost every day. You can find uh, probably hundreds of the shows on YouTube, but this show was creating uh, an image of uh, Ukrainian politicians among the audience as uh, of uh, corrupt, stupid, etc. Uh, people who are just accidentally are in power. I mean, I will not say that Ukraine is not corrupt or Ukrainian politicians are not corrupt. Corruption is a very famous phenomena, uh, which actually is also something uh, to do with post-Soviet time because Ukrainian and Russian oligarchs were growing together and actually learning from each other how to control media, how to get to power. But in Ukraine, actually, the oligarchs became more important than politicians. In uh, Russia, secret service people became more important than oligarchs and took over and created their own oligarchy. And actually, from 2015, a uh, comedy show uh, with uh, Vladimir Zelensky, Alek Kashevoy, Yuzik, and others, I mean, they, they did create the whole Muppet show of a very nasty kind about active and acting Ukrainian politicians. And this uh, tendency was actually only getting stronger and stronger, and influence of TV practically was immense and it turned into electoral influence. It couldn't be otherwise. And let's uh, move to another uh, picture. This is Igor Kolomoisky, uh, a man who deserves uh, probably a good uh, two volume saga or novel about his life. And I will just stop on a couple of episodes. Uh, during Euromaidan, when uh, Donbass announced that they will separate from Ukraine, but they were also trying to expand and the pro-Russian forces were trying to start riots, pro-Russian riots or pro-Russian uh, revolutions, if you can say, in Kharkov, in uh, Dnipro, in Zaporizhia, in Odessa, in all big cities and medium-sized cities in the south and in the east. And uh, uh, of course, there was always a competition between Dnipropetrovsk and Donetsk and Dnipro Dnipropetrovsk region and Donetsk region. And Igor Kolomoisky created at his own expense uh, battalions of volunteers to defend Dnipropetrovsk uh, region, uh, which was under his active control from Donbass separatists. And he succeeded actually, I mean, he, uh, in this case, the interests of the country and his own interests coincided. And Dnipro was an example of a big city and big region which stood up together with Kyiv against pro-Russian expansion. But later he was asked by uh, President Poroshenko to become the governor of Dnipropetrovsk. Uh, Dnipropetrovsk was rena renamed Dnipro. And, uh, uh, as a governor, he had already some problems with Poroshenko and was dismissed. And then the conflict actually deteriorated and he had to hide himself in Israel. He escaped from the country, although he was trying to control his business empire, which was and remains quite significant, including the biggest bank of Ukraine, Privat Bank, which was nationalized uh, during Poroshenko's presidentship because of the financial wrongdoings of the managers when it belonged to, uh, uh, to Mr. Kalamoisky. And uh, of course, with the uh, election of Zelensky, Kalamoisky returned. Uh, TV channel one plus one uh, on the eve of New Year 2018, to, to uh, New Year 2019 actually, postponed or edited or moved on uh, the uh, good wishes of President Poroshenko in order to broadcast a short video by 
Zelensky, Vladimir Zelensky, in which he, in a role of future president of Ukraine, congratulated Ukrainians with the new year. And he announced that he is going to take part in the elections. And this is a picture uh, from this broadcast. And of course, uh, celebrities in, in the world are better known than politicians, although for Ukraine, I think the faces of politicians are equal in their uh, sort of recognizability with the faces of celebrities. But uh, Mr. Zelensky was, of course, number one celebrity among uh, Ukrainian comedians. And he got immediately his audience to become his viewers, his electors, because he was uh, in the shows and in the film, which is called The Servant of the People, where he played Ukrainian president, uh, he showed himself as a potential reformer. So, I mean, he made the viewers to compare the president played by Zelensky with the president, with the real president, uh, either Yanukovych or the next president, Poroshenko. And uh, after the victory of Zelensky, and uh, I mean, the previous record victory in presidential elections belonged to President Poroshenko, who won in uh, one round elections with 53% uh, of votes. Uh, Zelensky, Vladimir Zelensky won uh, elections with 73% votes. So I think uh, it's probably the uh, record which will be kept for many, many years in Ukraine, because for this record, you need again, a lot of representative of collective mentalities, mentality. And uh, Zelensky achieved this effect actually thanks to working actually for people, for a lot of people with collective mentalities because the people with individualist mentalities don't watch TV so much. And there is a conflict, even conflict of interests between uh, Vladimir Zelensky and so to say, today's cultural opposition. Uh, let's go to next slide, please. Well, uh, when uh, Vladimir Zelensky became the president of Ukraine in the first year, about 30 comedians, producers, lawyers, and contractors of this comedy show uh, became statesmen or members of parliament. And today, uh, Practically, the office of president is run by Andrei Yermak, who is film producer, and Sergei Shefir, uh, who is film script writer and also film producer. And actually, he was film script, uh, film script writer of the series, uh, The Servant of the People. Andrei Yermak is the head of the presidential office. Uh, in the presidential office, probably half of the uh, main positions are occupied, if not more, by people whom uh, Vladimir Zelensky knows professionally from TV uh, work, from TV job. While the lawyer of the comedy show Block 95, Ivan Bakanov became the new head of the Secret Service of Ukraine. And uh, uh, the producer of One Plus One TV channel, Alexander Tkachenko became Minister of Culture. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is the information that I shared with you uh, now. Uh, and uh, if we go further, uh, please, we can talk about servant of the people. Well, uh, I will refer you now first to a uh, political system in Russia where the wine, one main party is actually controlling the whole system. This party is mentioned already, uh, United Russia. In Ukraine, because of the individualistic mentality, we have more than 350 political parties. So every person who wants to go into politics, he either looks whether he wants to join one party or another party, or if he is not happy with their programs or with their members, he starts his own party. And I think Ukraine is the uh, country with the biggest number of political parties. And many of these parties are frozen or sleeping and you can defrost the party 
you can sell a small party. And uh, I uh, advise you actually to check the story of this party servant of the people because it had also different name. It was registered by different personalities, but uh, the members were collected actually online. And as the result, uh, there was no ideology uh, announced. Uh, first, actually, the politicians who were creating the party and promoting it, they were saying that the, they are libertarians, but uh, this uh, idea is long forgotten. And now we have uh, the biggest party in the Ukrainian parliament with members having sometimes opposite views about very important issues. Uh, about issues of status of Ukrainian language, because some of the members of this party want to rediscuss already accepted uh, law about uh, functioning of the state language of Ukraine. Uh, there are members of the party who want better relationship with Russia, uh, more uh, political and economical ties. Uh, there is one member of the party who recently went to support uh, Belarusian president uh, Lukashenko and had a special rendezvous with him publicly and uh, expressed him support, which was of course not support of the political party, the servant of the people, but it was individual support of an individualist Ukrainian politician who came to parliament with the party servant of the people. And of course, there is as always a group of deputies who are representing the interests of Igor Kalamoisky. Of course, I mean, the main point of today's politics, uh, policies of uh, Vladimir Zelensky is an attempt to de-oligarchize Ukraine, to fight with oligarchs and their influences. Uh, so, I mean, many people are waiting to see if he will fight with uh, Igor Kalamoisky who actually was uh, his boss for many, many years on TV, TV channel one plus one. At the moment, he's fighting with the oligarch uh, Viktor Medvedchuk, who is the practically official representative or non-official representative of Vladimir Putin in Ukraine, and uh, who is very friendly with Putin's family and circle of friends and with Kremlin's uh, circles. Let's go to the next slide, please. And this is the, the last slide and the last issue. Of course, if you have many uh, people from show business and from TV in the government, in the parliament, in presidential office, the creativity is, become, is becoming one of the most important words. And himself, Vladimir Zelensky, actually is using very often creative approach to uh, different ways of passing messages uh, to Ukrainian uh, society. He records video monologues in a very sort of uh, cr creative way uh, from the fitness uh, halls, from Tesla cars, etc. And uh, from time to time, he is trying also to use the uh, traditional uh, red days, red calendar days uh, to send a message. And on the left, this is uh, uh, another embroidered short day, Vishavanka day in Ukraine a year or two ago, where he is wearing traditional Ukrainian Vishavanka and his wife Olena is wearing also traditional Ukrainian Vishavanka for blouse. Uh, two days ago, we had uh, Vishavanka day again, and uh, uh, probably he didn't think that actually uh, the, the design of his Vishavanka will create such an uproar and uh, such a noise in social media, not only in uh, Ukraine, but also in Russia, and even commentaries from Russian uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I mean, this time, actually, his designer uh, prepared for him Vishkavanka, which is uh, created based on the design which is used for Russian traditional ethnic short, which is called Kasavarotka. And, uh, uh, the, of course, the, the people from administration of the Ukrainian president, they uh, did announce that this is also Ukrainian Vishavanka, which is used in the east of the country, and uh, sometimes also in Belarus, uh, the uh, Russian officials and specialists 
announced that actually he was wearing Russian uh, embroidered short. And uh, some people read it as a message of friendship to Russia, a sort of, uh, of uh, friendliness uh, to Russian culture. Uh, if you were following the quotations and the uh, messages of uh, Vladimir Zelensky in the last two years, you probably would remember that he wanted first to look at the eyes of Putin and to find peace there. I mean, he believed the whole year, 2019-20, uh, that he will be able to negotiate peace for Ukraine and removal of Russian volunteers and Russian arms and Russian officers from uh, separ separatist territories and from uh, annexed Crimea. Now, actually, uh, these dreams are over and I think he understands that uh, any peace agreement is almost impossible, especially without uh, Western interference and Western allies. But still, uh, he decided to wear this embroidered short. And uh, of course, uh, uh, it was not probably a very clever decision because this uh, conflict or noise about the, uh, his embroidered short uh, turned out to be much uh, louder than two hours of press conference, annual press conference that he gave yesterday in Kyiv. Well, uh, we uh, probably will be never back uh, to the previous situation in Ukraine because Ukraine is too dynamic and uh, too unpredictable. But uh, what one can predict that it will never be dull and it was never dull in Ukraine, especially if we talk about politics. And another thing that Ukrainians will go back to the historical matrix completely late, sooner or later. And it is a country of individualists. So the elections will remain the national sport. And uh, the results of these elections will probably amuse international audience, not once, but many times in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrei. It was very informative. I also learned a lot about the presence of media people uh, in the office of president. I feel with your background in script writing, you can also apply for a job in administration. I'm too old. <laughs> uh, okay, so we already have started collecting questions. Um, I'm not sure whether you have access to the questions, so I feel like I will be reading them. But before, uh, there are very specific questions. Uh, I wanna uh, ask you a question about the role of humor in general, because uh, Zelensky's show attracts mostly the younger generation. Um, it's all based on a very kind of uh, slap uh, uh, humor, um, uh, like stand-up comedian uh, genres. Uh, and uh, according to the recent uh, elections, the a majority of uh, electorate who supported was in the group of uh, 25, 30 year old uh, uh, the generation of millennials. So do you think uh, we are witnessing some major shift in the political culture in terms of participation of the young people uh, with even more individualistic mentality, as you say? And uh, if you want to make a parallel with what's going on uh, in the changes uh, in the electorate culture in Russia, it looks like also most of Alexei Navalny's and oppositionist uh, supporters are millennials, the children of the uh, post-Soviet generation. So what is the role of popular culture and humor in general in this shift? Well, I, I, I'd like actually to, to read myself a research of uh, influence of today's television on young viewers, uh, because from my uh, uh, talks with young people and people, I mean, who are 20 or 30 years old, I had always an idea that they don't watch TV and uh, they think that actually TV is watched by retired people or people over 45 and over 50. But obviously the, uh, the audience of Zelensky's show shows uh, are uh, yeah, becoming younger. And I think partially it, it is uh, not only because of his uh, very direct satire on uh, 
professional politicians through television, but also because he is with his show, he is touring the country. He was touring uh, not only Ukraine, he was touring Russia with the same uh, shows. So uh, for, for young people, for millennials, actually attending shows and concerts is more important than watching TV. Watching TV on the sofa is something really associated with a very passive way of life and passive perception of life around you. Uh, so I think this is a sort of a result of two things mixed together. Uh, maybe some of his uh, viewers became viewers uh, after watching his shows on YouTube, which is more common thing than to watch television for young people, or attending his concerts in different cities. And of course, uh, I mean, intellectual humor is never popular. So, I mean, you have to adapt your humor uh, to the level of the audience and sometimes to the sort of bottom uh, line of the level and I uh, any, any producer and any comedian understands this so uh, I assume that actually Vladimir Zelensky himself is much more clever than the 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 humor he is producing I totally agree uh, so we have uh, two questions one is actually a suggestion from Dr. Bogdan Rishkevich if Ukraine is a democratic, occasional anarchic variant of the Eastern Slavic world, how do you help it to vaccinate its people in the face of it, in the face of its authoritarian neighbor? So, what can we do to help vaccinate? It's slightly irrelevant for this talk, but uh, just keep in mind this contact. Well, I mean, we we, we are all under influence of information. I mean, we. People, I mean, in, in Ukraine, those who are responsible, they should find different sources of information for the audience, understanding which part of audience uh, trusts which source of information. And actually, you have to deal uh, with uh, sometimes maybe with unpopular sources of uh, uh, information uh, just in order to delegate them to pass the message that vaccination is necessary in order to survive and in order to stabilize the health situation in the country. The second question from Metro Koval. Thanks a lot for an interesting talk, Andre. It seems to me that unlike in most other countries in Ukraine, a huge share of humor's market is occupied by one production company. Wouldn't you say that one of the factors that influenced the huge success of President Zelensky in 2019 was the monopolization of humor in Ukraine? Well, uh, monopolization of audience, uh, first of all. So, I mean, if you see that the biggest, actually, three TV channels belong to three main oligarchs, one of uh, whom, Dmitro Firtash, is under house arrest in Vienna for three years already. Another one, Igor Kolomoisky, uh, is under investigation for money laundering in USA. And third one, actually, uh, Renat Akhmetov, the owner of Ukraina TV channel, I mean, he, he, he is not a public person. He is not trying to give interviews and he never criticized Russia for annexation of Crimea or starting the war in Donbass. So we have a situation where uh, three oligarchs are competing with their shows on their TV channels. And uh, uh, the, the, the most clever of them, obviously, is Igor Kalamoisky. Otherwise, he wouldn't buy this comedy show from another TV channel. So he saw the potential, he invested enough money in the promotion. The other TV uh, comedy shows like Diesel Show, uh, they didn't have so much promotion, didn't have so much money. So they were behind. And uh, that's why actually, yes, we can say that there is a monopolization of humor. And the first association, if you think about TV comedy shows will be, of course, block number 95. And uh, the other thing is that actually, this TV show was mostly in Russian and the competing TV shows, uh, some of them were in Ukrainian. And the most active uh, audience was in, uh, TV audience uh, was and probably is in Russian speaking regions of Ukraine. Thank you, Andrei. I would disagree that it, it's monopolized as of 2021. Diesel show actually gained more viewers uh, during the New Year Eve, uh, which is the most uh, popular uh, show. Uh, and also there are like regional TV channels that uh, popular in uh, different parts of, of Ukraine. 
Yeah, well, I, I, I can add to this that actually I think uh, Block 95 uh, is losing now because uh, because they are in the government, they are in, in politics. I mean, so the company lost uh, the the best personnel, the best uh, professional uh, sort of specialists, the best actors. So I, I think if the comedians and producers go back to Block 95 production. Uh, the comedy show will uh, have a new revival. <laughs> exactly. The question from Orisa Prokopovich, what do you think about Zelensky's second term? Didn't he say that he will serve one more term? Or did he say that he will serve only one term? Or he well, was he, announced he's right. He, he's, he's learning to be a proper politician. He is learning to not to deliver promises and to contradict his own words and to do what he uh, promised not to do. So in this sense, actually, he is becoming a politician. Of course, he promised to, to come only for four years and then uh, uh, go back to television. But, uh, but now, actually, since uh, uh, the way uh, he runs politics is very risky. I mean, I, I can foresee, and many people can foresee uh, uh, court suits against him when he uh, retires from presidentship because of the uh, bre breaking the laws and uh, mishandling the, 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 the different instructions and etc. So, so uh, his uh, uh, group of people whom he brought to power obviously will also demand or ask him to stay because they also uh, are in danger once their job is done and they have to return to life with no immunity and no protective connections of their colleagues. Thank you, uh, Andrei. The next question from Irina Odrychivska. Thank you for a great talk. How do you envision the Ukrainian future of the transfer from violence to vaudeville? Perhaps the next three vagueness, lack of certainty among Ukrainians in their future? Well, I think people, especially young people, are becoming more and more self-confident and it is more difficult to dictate them what to do and what to think. And they, they, they are also very cynical. And uh, I think uh, part of these cynical people also actually were voting for Zelensky because they wanted a politician without politics, because he was not uh, associated with any concrete ideology or any concrete uh, promise, political promise. So, so uh, we will, uh, in the future, probably uh, if we win, and probably we will win, in, I mean, survive, uh, we will uh, have the situation of uh, even more passive majority of citizens and a uh, uh, more professional minority of politicians. So uh, because, I mean, majority of Germans, majority of Belgians, I mean, they are not interested in, in politics because they, they live in stable society, they have stable economy, uh, the uh, infrastructure of the state delivers what is promised by the law. So once we have this situation, it will not be very important who is in power, because then the system is more important than the personality. We, we didn't cross yet this line into the situation. So we still have personalities much more important than the system and personalities changing the political system and state system every month, every day. So that's why, I mean, uh, that, 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 that's why, I mean, we have several changes in one year on the subsidies to people who don't have enough money to pay for the communal charges. And every time they have to reapply for the subsidies and they have to re-deliver the documents, paper documents, etc. So, I mean, in this situation, everybody becomes very politicized because the politics touch or destroy the stability of personal life. Thank you. One question from our master's student, Carly. To ask a follow-up question to your response to Yulia, how the Russian views of, of Zelensky's show? Are they millennials with certain political beliefs? Does the show also have Western viewership? Uh, no, the Block 95 has no Western uh, viewership and, uh, and, and cannot have it because it is very contextual. It is very inside Ukrainian situation, but it is uh, understandable and it is funny for Russian uh, side because 
uh, Russian viewers are watching this show with double pleasure because I mean, they also laugh at Zelensky and comedians uh, who are laughing at the political situation in, in Ukraine. But this is actually a na national product for national use. Yeah, it has a lot of inside jokes uh, of current uh, political developments. So I don't think uh, Russian millennials would appreciate No, that. no, no, Russian, Russian millennials are somewhere else. I mean, they, they are living in different country in different, uh, I would say, uh, even in different vocabulary. So, I mean, they will not find the proper word in Russian for what they see sometimes in Ukrainian comedy shows. But we need to mention that the Servant of People, the TV show, was purchased by Netflix, and you can see it uh, with English subtitles if you have subscription on Netflix. It's very popular, actually. Uh, so another question from Lazar Fleischmann. What do you think about Dmitry Gardon's claims that a large group of Zelensky's associates in his party and in the government still are secret puppets of Putin's Russia? Well, there are these allegations, and uh, there, are, uh, there are definitely people with Russian business connections, like Andrei Yermak, who is the second, if not the first man, well, I mean, he's second after Zelensky, but sometimes people say that he's first and Zelensky is second, and he uh, worked with Russian film producers, and actually, as you know, there is a tradition in Eastern Europe where uh, TV producers and film producers are very often members of the political circles. And they, they, they are sometimes fulfilling the secret or half secret uh, political requests. And uh, here, I mean, I, I don't want to mention, but I mean, in, in Russia, you have very influential film producers and TV producers who are definitely involved in Russian politics. So, so uh, one can uh, think that actually there are connections and definitely there would be desire from Russian side to use these people once they became statesmen and uh, Ukrainian politicians. Uh, I don't know, I mean, it's not for me to, to say uh, that I'm sure that it, it happens or it, I'm not sure it happens. But there are grounds to talk about this. Any other questions? Please uh, go ahead and type them in. So we ran out of questions, Andre. If you want to say a couple, couple, couple conclusion. Thoughts? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I've, I'm extremely happy to to be Ukrainian and to live in Ukraine. And I think actually, it's much easier to be a writer in Ukraine and more interesting than to be a writer in Britain or Germany. Anyway, the, the country gives so much material and every day gives so much, so many pieces of news and so many different plots and stories that uh, uh, I, I, I can envy historians and politologists who will take Ukraine as their topic for research or for their scientific work or for nonfiction book. And I hope that actually uh, my talk may be provoked more interest among some of the uh, uh, viewers and listeners uh, to pay more attention to what is happening in Ukraine. And I can assure you that what is happening in Ukraine will have direct and uh, very strong impact on whole of European history and European future. Thank you, Andrei. Uh, I feel like on this optimistic note, uh, we will conclude today. Thank you everyone for joining us and asking interesting questions. Uh, Please come to our afternoon talks uh, at Chris uh, every Friday at noon. You can check the schedule uh, online. Thank you. Thank you also. Thank Yvonne. you very much for listening to me and for all the questions asked.